The interesting part about impulse purchases is technically speaking, they're never impulse. And not a lot of people know this. And I, I, I'm like, I hate the burst your bubble because <laughs> a lot of companies spend a lot of money trying to get people to just purchase one-off products based uh -huh. on a TikTok ad or Facebook ad, whatever. But the impulse purchase that you see is usually based on some sort of long existing need. This one's sponsor is Triple Whale. Supercharge your ad campaigns with their revolutionary analytics platform because better data means better campaigns. If you're running any type of paid media, then you need to be using Triple Whale. Find out more at trytriplewhale.com. Today on the DTC Deep Dive, we're gonna be finding out why people buy your product and how knowing that can help you sell more. We're gonna be talking to Sarah Levenger, which is a behavior science and customer psychology guru. She's gonna be chatting everything to do with what makes our brain tick, what makes a consumer click on your advert. An incredibly interesting episode and a little di bit different from our usual type. So stay tuned, because it's gonna be a good one. Welcome. Sarah to the D to C deep dive. How are you doing? We've been we've been we've been wanting to chat for such a long time. We've been chatting on the DMs on Twitter. We've been <laughs> responding to each other, and finally, I have you on the podcast, and I'm so excited finally. to talk. <laughs> it's gonna be fun. I'm doing really really well today. I woke up and I was like, we're gonna chat. I'm so excited to do the podcast today because yeah, we've been talking a long time and following each other, all these posts and retweeting, and I'm like, I just I really want to talk today in person, well, in video form. Yeah. Uh, and it's gonna be fun. I'm so excited. Thank you for having me. Yeah, that's okay. Today we're gonna be talking about, um, I don't I don't really know, basically we're gonna be talking about what makes people tick. I think that's probably the easiest way to say it. We're gonna be talking about yeah. behavior science, consumer psychology, all that stuff that goes into making people buy things and what's actually going on in our head. Um, Sarah, you are a fellow uh, creator, a fellow creative. I love speaking to other people that talk my language. So for people who have never heard of you, who don't know who you are, who don't, who aren't lucky enough to follow you on Twitter, like me, <laughs> intro yourself and what you do. Sure. Yeah. I am Sarah Levenger. Uh, I'm a creative strategist. I'm a brand strategist. Uh, I'm a UGC producer. And overall, I would say I'm just a behavior science enthusiast. So I'm really into the psychology uh, especially when it comes to marketing and getting people to click and buy. Amazing. So let me give you a bit of background. I did sociology back in like high school Ooh. for us. So I uh -huh. know a bit of a bit of what, what makes society tick. And that really interested <laughs> me. And I think that kind of yeah. comes back to the marketing side of stuff because we kind of do need to know how people tick in order to make content Absolutely. that converts, right? Mm -hmm. So educate us. What is briefly anyway what is like customer psychology and why why should we care about it as marketers as brand owners what's the what's the point yeah yeah well and this it's a really interesting question because i i get this question a lot honestly like what is it why is it important and i find it fascinating that most marketers don't have at least the basic knowledge of consumer psychology uh because the entirety of what we do as marketers is sell to a brain, we're selling to a human person. Mm -hmm. And so the, the basis of what I do is finding out what makes people interested in things in the first place. Why would anybody buy a product to begin with? Like, why do we even buy stuff? And then take it into a brand form of like, how can you actually use that desire of buying things to your advantage as a brand in your marketing? A lot, a lot of research. So this goes down deep into what your customers are feeling at the time that they purchased. How did they even get to that decision? Why did they actually decide to purchase something? And then what made them kind of like tip over the hill and actually make the purchase themselves? Because every brand is different. Every customer journey is different. And without the psychology knowledge of why people buy, it's very, very difficult to craft messaging that is one, efficient and two, cheap. <laughs> it gets very expensive mm -hmm. to market to people and customers when you don't have any sort of knowledge on why they're buying in the first place. Yeah, what I mean, what's the what's the first place that people can start to find out why people buy their product? Because, I mean, yeah. for for, yeah. for me anyway, the first thing that comes to mind, and probably the reason why I buy most products is it solves a problem for me. It makes it it makes my life easier, right? I mm -hmm. buy I don't know some kitchen utensil because it makes my terrible cooking slightly better. <laughs> so, where can where can brands begin? to find out why customers, like on a deeper level, why customers are buying their product? Yeah, that is a great question. So the majority of what I do is comment research, review research, and just any sort of consumer report research. 
So that's where I would say start first. And if, if you're a brand new brand and you have no comments and, and no reviews, the best place to go is obviously just your competitors uh, because they obviously have the data that you're looking for. So I would say the easiest place to go to find out why people are buying your product is to read through your reviews. Now, I've been doing this for over 10 years, so it's pretty easy for me to look through things and say, okay, I know exactly why these people are buying. Like I'm seeing a trend, it's coming up over and over. But when you're first starting out, some of the easiest things to do is put it into a word analyzer, put it into sentiment analyzers. There's free items that you can use online to kind of help you dig through the data, or you'll hire someone like me to come in and actually look through. So the last one that I did was for a, a brand that was in the gardening space. And they're doing really, really well, but their problem is they're kind of seeing a little bit of a slump this year as almost everybody is. And they're deciding, okay, we, we're launching some new products. We'd really like to kind of push forward you know, with our, with our messaging. And we're tr trying to decide what's the best way to message to the people that we're bringing into our ecosystem. So I went through and I read 300 of the comments just on their website and I analyzed 115. Uh, and when I say analyzed, I took them into the data analyzers and actually crunched the numbers. And it brought back to the interesting part was they were trying to push this as a product that was more of like a, like a luxury to have this particular item, right? But what it ended up, what we ended up finding is people were actually thinking of this more as like a pet. <laughs> they weren't thinking of it in a luxury way. They were thinking of it more as like, you know, something interesting to have in their house. Like they really enjoyed like, you know, nurturing with these products. And so it's interesting because the things you think your people think about your product is not actually always what they actually think about it. And it's not really the reason why they purchase it. So this is the reason why your comments and reviews are the best place you can go to figure out what your people want. Because they're going to tell you from the review based upon the words that they used, how they're feeling about it when they purchase and how they feel about it now. Yeah. And then how can you use that in order to craft efficient content because i think that's the most important thing yeah. like is is then actually acting on that data because yeah great i've got all this data but now what do i do with it so like yeah. what's yeah. what's the next stage to that yeah exactly so once you have a kind of a good base so say for instance you're selling chocolate right and you went through all of your reviews and you found that these people really really love to gift this chocolate like that they're using it to nurture their friends or their family or whoever then you can go into your messaging and shift it just slightly and say something to the effect of, you know, this is the best gift to give someone for Mother's Day or, you know, give this someone for their birthday, that type of thing. That's a more literal translation. But even deeper than that, you can push forward an emotional message of saying care for the people in your life, give them this chocolate, right? That hits a little deeper than just, it's a great gift. You should give it to somebody. We're, we're looking more towards what's the deeper goal that they have, which is nurturing their family. And how can we hit that in our messaging? So copywriting comes into play and graphic design comes into play as well. One of the biggest things that I see brands sort of slide on is they're not quite sure which imagery to use when they come into doing ads and things like that. So if we have the psychology base and we know what people are going after from an emotional deep standpoint, I can come in and say, okay, your people are looking for community. They're trying to nurture. They're really into being involved with people. All of your images need to show at least two, maybe three people in them. Because if you're showing one image at a time, one person in an image usually states solo. It states, you know, individualism and it mm -hmm. states kind of elitism a little bit. But if you have more than one person in an image, that states community. It brings apart all of those feelings of being involved with people. So this... I, I hate to say it this way because I feel like I freak marketers out, but like everything kind of matters, <laughs> like yeah. everything matters, uh, it, including what colors are used in your images, how many people are in your images, what clothes they're wearing, like what the background is. All of it is going to make an instant psychological connection with people in one or two ways. They're either going to like what they see or they're not. <laughs> so it's very, very important to have this basis before you go into creating. Yeah, so almost every marketer every creator should have an understanding of you know of mm -hmm. why people are buying this this product if you're a creator working with a brand or maybe you're an agency working with a brand and they and they don't have this data you know you mm -hmm. ask them okay well why are people buying your products and they don't have that like what should what should be the next step for you should should you go ahead and start to find this data for yourself or like what's what's the best best way to act on this from a creator's point of view if the brand mm -hmm. doesn't have anything in place. The nice part about creators is they have a little bit more freedom than the brands do because brands are trying to push forward a specific message. They're always trying to 
you know, push forward what, what they would like the world to hear about them. Creators, you can kind of get a little bit more flexible with it because you're in the industry space. So for instance, a lot of the UGC creators that I work with are on TikTok all the time. They're just consuming, consuming, which is fantastic because they already know what's working in the space. So if the brand doesn't have any sort of psychographic data to give you, I would say as a creator, you have full of it, like availability to go on TikTok or Instagram or Facebook and consume it yourself. Because as soon as you start consuming content, you'll start to notice trends come up where every single video that is produced in this particular industry has this emotion to it. It's sad or it's happy or they're disappointed or they're frustrated. Like you can tell pretty closely, pretty easily once you start consuming enough. And as a creator, I think I think it's it's just to your value to go and consume this content and make it easy on yourself. Uh, because a lot of the brands just don't have time to do it. They they wish they did, <laughs> but that's why they hire people like me to come in and do the research for them. Um, but creators, get out there, just start consuming content because you have a much better a much better way to to frame it to the brands to help the brands push their push their you know products forward. Just because you have time that they don't. Yeah. Do you, have you found that because of platforms like? TikTok and like the the rise of I guess kind of like impulse purchases right almost almost everything that you buy on social at least to a certain price scale anyway you are kind of buying in the spare of the moment especially with TikTok with like TikTok made me buy it and stuff like that have you found that yeah. that that that's affected the reason why people buy things that sometimes it's much more on a surface level than it is a deeper level yeah the interesting part about impulse purchases is technically speaking, they're never impulse. And not a lot of people know this. And I, I, I'm like, I hate the burst your bubble because <laughs> a lot of companies spend a lot of money trying to get people to just purchase one-off products based uh-huh. on a TikTok ad or a Facebook ad, whatever. But the impulse purchase that you see is usually based on some sort of long existing need. Mm. So the, the most recent impulse purchase that I made was uh, dog bags because I have two Yorkies and I have to take them outside and whatever. And usually I, I buy the same bags every single time, but I saw one on TikTok that was like compostable. You could just like throw in the trash and eventually it would disappear, right? Like I'm, I'm trying to be better about the planet. I'm not trying to throw away a bunch mm-hmm. of trash out on TikTok, purchase it immediately. I don't need dog bags. I have like three boxes already. Mm-hmm. I don't need them, but I purchased them on a whim. I was like, cool, yes, buy it today. I love it, it's decompostable, great. The reason I purchased it, though, is because I have been creating some sort of psychological subconscious need for a compostable bag, right? I've been looking for a way to not trash as much plastic. And that's been happening over months. The impulse purchase just happened because, and this is something we can go into as well. That impulse purchase happened because that particular brand happened to hit on a heuristic, a mental shortcut that I appreciated, that I was able to resonate with. And so I just like tipped over the edge and bought. Yeah, let, let's talk about that because I think that's, I think every marketer has probably, to an extent, yeah, we all kind of understand the impulse purchases on exactly an impulse purchase. Nobody just buys something, this is the first yep. time they've ever heard of it and buys it. Like nobody <laughs> does that. Like we all have something in the back of our head. So what what are those what did you call the mental, mental, mental shortcuts? Yep. Mental shot. Let's heuristic. talk about mental. What are mental shortcuts? Okay. <laughs> so the technical term is a heuristic. It's a, it, and I, I don't like to use the term too often because people are like, what the heck is a heuristic? So mental shortcut, right? Um, the most common ones that you hear about, especially in marketing, the ones that are used over and over and over to, to good benefit. Uh, I think they're a little overused. Uh, social proof and authority proof. Those are the two that I see the most often, especially in the e-com space, DTC space, because they work, obviously, like they're, they're very powerful heuristics. Uh, but social proof has all kinds of different things to it. Like it's not just one type of proof. Like there's just one social proof. You can have expert social proof. You can have celebrity social proof. You can have friend-based social proof or crowd-based social proof. Like there's different types, but the, it's just one type of mental shortcut. So there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of ones that you can use one of the ones that I, I really love to use the most is the mental shortcut of anchoring. So this is also, also called focalism, but anchoring itself basically just means that you're relying on the first piece of info that you get to base your decision-making skills on everything else. So for instance, if you buy, if you are looking for a t-shirt and that t-shirt costs $1,200 and you keep searching Expensive and find a t-shirt. shirt that's $100, exactly. Mm. <laughs> 
you're going to say, oh, that $100 t-shirt is a deal, right? Even though that $100 t-shirt is actually way more expensive than a $2 t-shirt. But in your mind, you just made that anchoring price way higher than it should be. So this is something I see brands do a lot is like, we are selling something really expensive in the space and we can't get people to get past the price. And I come in, do some research and tell them, okay, well, you're anchoring to something that's very low. Your price is $100, but you're telling people that the anchor price they should be thinking about is five. Too, too, too big of a distance of an anchor. You need to be telling them that we're saving you money off of $1,000, not off of a $5 product. Is that how I imagine like the sale price works, right? It mm -hmm. was four thousand yep. dollars it's now one pound 99 like 100 yep yep it, is that but i think i think there's also i know this from like the drop shipping days is that there is a bit of a stigma around that now mm -hmm. that people yep. see that and they go nah it, it wasn't originally seven seven hundred bucks yeah. there's no way it was yeah. originally that <laughs> like yeah because because of that stigma and because we're as consumers becoming more aware of that what can brands do mm -hmm. to price anchor and almost value their products higher in the customer's yeah. mind? How can brands do that away from just marking it down on their website? Because it's a yeah. bit cheap to do that now, I think. That is a great question. There's all kinds of weird things that you can do psychologically to change the anchor itself. For instance, they've done studies where they have tracked people who have moved from their hometown to a different city. And they've noticed that the purchasing decisions that these people are making are set to the anchors of their hometown for at least two to three years. Oh. So if you're marketing to someone that moved from Chicago to like New York, <laughs> the price anchoring on even simple things like gas or like, you know, chocolate bars, whatever it is, is very different in both cities. So that particular customer moving from one town to another is gonna have an anchoring issue for two years. So their their purchasing decisions will change. And, and that's, I, I tell you this, cause I'm like, this is extremely powerful information and it's terrifying when you think about it. Mm -hmm. Because for a brand who's trying to get people to purchase things, if you're in a space such as like, especially if you're in like the soda space, like if, if you're Coca-Cola or like Pepsi or even like Olapop, like you have an anchor that's already set. The entire industry has already set an anchor price for that. And if you go above the anchor, it's going to be pretty difficult to compete and get people to purchase because their mm -hmm. anchor might just be two to three dollars. If you're pricing yours at five, you're going to have to give them a very, very good reason for why they should part with like three extra dollars. <laughs> so one of the most interesting ones that I've found is psychologically, research wise, at least they have found that men in particular respond to red colors of prices much stronger than other colors. So for guys in the space of like men's clothing or men's fitness wear, whatever, your prices should specifically use the color red on anything that's crossed out. So if you're using a crossed out, you know, price mm -hmm. with the discounted price next to it, that crossed out price should always be red because it just, it resonates with that human brain side much easier than any other color. So those are tactics that you can use to try and get yourself into a different space. Or like I tell people, you need to set the anchor to a different, a different thing. It's, you got to attach it to something else. If you're selling a thousand dollar car, you need to attach it to like a Ferrari, something way higher <laughs> instead mm. of attaching it to like a $600 car. The anchor yeah. matters. Whatever you're anchoring to matters a lot. This week's edition of the DTC Deep Dive is brought to you by Plastique. If you're a DTC brand or wholesaler, then cash flow is probably your top concern. Well, Plastique can help. Plastique is a business payment tool that unlocks your working capital by helping you pay your biggest expenses by credit card. Anything from inventory to marketing spend can be paid on by credit card, allowing you to float cash up to 100 days. Brands like Obvi, Universal Standard, and Sunbasket use Plastique as a short-term financing tool to increase credit and pay vendors all over the world. Most suppliers don't accept credit card, but Plastique lets you pay by credit card and sends the payment to your supplier however they would prefer. Check out Plastique for yourself at Plastique.com. That's P-L-A-S-T-I-Q.com and see how Plastique can fuel your cash flow. How do you change what you're anchored to? Sure, surely it isn't just as easy as going, oh yeah, well that's that price and this is this price because people are just going to be like, well, yeah, of course you're going to compare your car to a Ferrari because it's really expensive. <laughs> like, like yeah. how, how, how do you go about choosing what, what you're anchored to? Yeah. Well, some of it's like arbitrary. You could literally just state a price. 
sometimes people don't know what the anchor is. I was working with a yoga brand that's really, really good. Their product is fantastic. And they're super, super like high quality yoga products, but they're, they're struggling because the anchor in the entire industry is way more expensive, way more kind of, I don't know, big brand. And so what I told them to do was uh, we need to find out and see whether people are actually anchoring to the big brands, because if they are, we're going to have, we're going to struggle. Because if they know the higher anchors, they're always going to think yours is, is a different quality. We did the research, did a whole bunch of interviews, and we found out that people didn't actually know what the prices of the top tier yoga mats were, which is fantastic for us because we can make up whatever anchor we want then. So on his new landing pages, any of the testing that we're doing, we are going to set an anchor price that's higher than the discounted price. And it works like it, it's it just going to work because they don't have another anchor to set to. Mm -hmm. If you're in an industry that already has an anchor, I would say try your hardest to push benefits as much as you possibly can and create an experience around your brand. Experience will always trump any sort of product based benefit. If you can create even like a packaging experience that will elevate the value and thus dictate a price. Yeah. Why, why is that in our yeah. head? Like it's the same thing with Apple. Like I love buying a new Apple product. I love it. Yep, I'm yep. sure everyone does that has ever bought an iPhone, right? Like mm -hmm. they even have it down to the fact where like the box lid is tight enough that like when you pull it off, it like slowly reveals yeah. it. Like what, <laughs> what is it in our brain, which is like, you know, like we see this stuff and it just instantly adds way more value mm -hmm. to something. It just makes us want to shout about that product. Like what is it in our brain, which is making us yeah. do that? Humans get really attached to products. We actually create a mental relationship with them. And a lot of the times this comes into a couple different things, depending on the type of person that you are. Most people have a, like a basis of things that they never grow out of. And this, this is really interesting because I didn't know any of this until I became a parent. <laughs> and then I started noticing like my children have very core needs that they just never grow out of, no matter how old they get. Mm -hmm. Every year they have the same like things that they have to have. One of them is nurturing. They need someone to comfort them, someone to love them, someone to like appreciate and enjoy being with them. The other one is obviously security. They're going to need something to feel safe. I need a house. I need a roof over my head. I need clothes, right? And then the next one is entertainment. They just need, they want to do something. They want to be involved in things. Like they're really interested in hands-on work. They want to produce, right? So from those three things, nurturing, security, and entertainment, this basically just continues throughout your entire life. So as consumers, we start to, to look for things as we get older to satisfy those three basic needs. And product packaging satisfies a lot of different things. It satisfies that nurturing because anytime, anytime you get a gift and it's beautiful and it's wonderful and like you open it up and it's like, oh my gosh, this is awesome. You hmm. just, the serotonin spikes, your oxytocin, like everything spikes. So many chemicals in your brain spike. And it also, it also ticks the box of like entertainment experience, right? So humans have very basic needs. Like they don't really change a whole lot. Uh, and brands are doing, a, some brands are doing a really, really good job of hitting those core basic needs. And Apple has done a really, really good job of hitting that base one of just, I want to feel loved and appreciated. And anytime you slide that box off, it's like, this is so nice. It's, it's just a nice experience of opening up my laptop. I like to talk about how, how different types of content make us want to buy products. So like right now, we all know that user generated content is, mm -hmm. you know, one of one of the most effective ways to make people make a purchase online. What are the types of content and why actually does UGC tick all those boxes for us? Like, because mm -hmm. even like five years ago before user generated was so popular, like the thing that used to make people buy was glossy TV ads and people used to love that. Whereas now we're all into the the lo-fi user generated mm -hmm. stuff like why why is user generated so so popular and so effective yeah yeah marketing tends to roll over into things that create a better uh connection with mirror neurons so in your brain there's a ton of synapse and everything is connected obviously by teeny tiny little connections uh one of the most powerful ones is mirror neurons it basically is is the brain's way of putting it putting itself in someone else's shoes this is the reason why kids learn quicker when they're uh, watching people do things. So for my two-year-old, he'll watch my four-year-old do things and he'll try and do it too, which terrifies crap out of me because he's two. <laughs> but the way he learns is by watching, right? So humans start with this basis of I need to watch somebody to be able to learn to do something. So once we got out of the radio era and we got into the TV era, people started noticing that when you're showing someone driving along a windy road, our car sales increase, right? So 
what they were basically doing was activating mirror neurons in humans. They were helping people to put themselves inside the car, driving the car. And that went on for decades and decades. TV was really, really big for a really long time, especially for a big brand. Uh, it also did a secondary thing, uh, activated a heuristic, like we talked about, a mental shortcut of familiarity. Anytime you as a brand can become more familiar to the people in your space, you have a higher chance of that person choosing you just purely based on the fact that they know about you. Not based on your products, not based on your marketing, but just because they know you exist. Coca-Cola has done this extremely well. <laughs> They've been around for so long that people just choose them because. So once we got to the internet age, we started noticing that YouTube got really big. Watching people do something that you were interested in worked extremely well for sales. Uh, and people got really, really into influencer marketing in like early 2000s all the way up until now. Uh, and that influencer marketing works pretty well because it hits on other heuristics as well, other mental shortcuts, familiarity, it hits on social proof, it hits on mirror neurons, like those type of things. If you can hit on a ton of different shortcuts, it makes it really easy to sell stuff. If you can get people to just easily fall into purchasing, you can sell products really, really easily. Um, it also helps to have a good product. But when we got to UGC, it was really interesting because this didn't pop up really until really until TikTok came out. So like somewhere within the last like three, four or five years, somewhere in there, we started noticing that like Instagram had reels kind of going and it was slowly kind of ramping up. And then as soon as TikTok hit the market, it did something for the human mind that no other platform has been able to do. And that's TikTok was able to turn individualism into community. Facebook couldn't do it. Instagram couldn't do it. Not even Pinterest could do it because it was a solo experience. So you had your own Facebook profile that you were able to curate on your own, right? And it was just whatever you mm -hmm. chose to see for the most part for a long time up until now. <laughs> now Facebook just tells you what you're going to see for the most part. Um, Instagram as well, though, that for a long time, it was a lot of individual pages where you would scroll and see what other people were doing and you could comment, but you couldn't really create a relationship with yeah. that person. We got to TikTok. And TikTok took people's individual interests and put them in a video format that was really short, obviously. <laughs> and people started to create a, a community around another person's life, which is really interesting. So brands started noticing that like when they started posting these actual tiny little video clips of testimonials, that they would see a huge spike in sales, right? The UGC came out, the user generated content was a, a better performer than any sort of static or any just product image. Uh, and that's because of the psychology behind it. It, it activates more neurons. It helps people to create that social proof and that social connection. Anytime you can take a product and give it a personality and, and start to emote from it, people will create a relationship with that product and they will be loyal for life. So TikTok's been huge, huge for people. Do you think... UGC will always be popular because I think it's one of those things very similar to how influencer marketing was. Influencer marketing had had a point where huge. it was huge. <laughs> yeah. It was yeah. the yeah, it was it was the main focus mm -hmm. of most people's marketing campaigns. Like if you didn't have some YouTuber advertising your product then it, you know you were yeah. you were doing yeah. marketing, right? But now since UGC um, and since I think brands have twigged that you don't need some mm -hmm. hype follower count person to be talking about your product, it's the it's the human connection yeah. which matters. Now, influencer marketing yeah. has kind of started to dwindle a bit, and it's less is yeah. less of such a major way to market. Do you see user generated going that going that way as I well? I do, and here's the reason why. I think eventually we are going to get to the point where like the the artificial realities are going to become a little bit more mainstream it's going to take a while i think uh but that's ramping up people really enjoy immersing themselves in an experience and right now ugc is immersive as you can get right but something else will come along eventually that's more immersive than ugc and the crowds will migrate to that just because heard you know her direction is a thing like People really like to stick yeah. within whatever everybody else is doing um, because it's a safety issue. So I think eventually something's going to come along that will replace UGC, just like UGC replaced influencer marketing. And it's not to say that influencer marketing doesn't work anymore, but it, it, it has a time and a place that you, you have to know where to use it and when to use it. And that's where yeah. creative strategy comes in. You have to know when to use 
every single piece of your marketing strategy. So someday, yeah, I think it'll probably die off. Yeah, yeah, I think I think that is, I mean, certainly in the past, I mean, probably since the start of this year, there has been a yeah. real push for user generated <laughs> content. It's everywhere on Twitter. It is like that there's more, there's more, I found at least, there's more what used to be deemed as influencers are now just calling themselves UGC creators, UGC yeah. creators <laughs> yeah. because they can see yeah. that's what brands want instead of mm-hmm. hiring an influencer you know and it's it is it is really interesting to uh to a follow if if there's brands creatives whoever who want to start implementing behavior science and start thinking more about how people you know how people think and why people buy things what's what's the easiest way for them to get started like what's the What's the what's the go to way that they can implement things and start yeah. to see yeah. some results? Uh, one of the easiest ways I would say is to do some research. Obviously, I'm I'm big on the research first. Make sure that you know exactly what your customers want to see, because if you don't know what your customers' heuristics are and what their higher order goals are and what their motivations are, it's gonna be really hard to see any sort of results if you're just picking, you know, mental shortcuts out of the air. So do your research first, get into your comments, get into your reviews and actually get to know your people. If you can't do that, I would say try your hardest to go and do some interviews with your customers before you even do any sort of changing your website or do A-B testing or get onto TikTok. Please, please, please do some interviews with your customers because you're going to find out more just from talking to a person face to face than you'll ever find out by doing any sort of, you know, surveys or emails or anything like that because face-to-face human interaction you can see people's expressions and you can see you know their gestures a lot of people I obviously talk with my hands a lot (laughs) but like body communication is extremely important you can tell how people feel about something based on what their shoulders are doing based on what their neck is doing like it's really important to talk to people (laughs) yeah exactly so we kind of come into the end now and to finish off I want to ask you a question which we ask everyone and I I probably know the answer because kind of everyone has the same answer at the moment but if you could only use one advertising platform for the next five years what would it be and why and more the more question is why is it TikTok (laughs) that (laughs) because that's what everyone's saying that that may as well just be the question at this point um I I have I struggle to answer this question because depending on the brand TikTok may not be the spot for you um, I'd say, yes, I'm glad someone <laughs> has said it. Finally, I, I flip back and forth between Google and TikTok. Um, surprisingly, oh, okay. I know people Tell are always why. like Google, like what? The reason I like Google is because it takes a lot of the psychological boxes that people need. Authority bias is huge for them. They've been around for forever. If you find it on Google, you trust it mm. implicitly just because it's on Google. <laughs> But the other thing Google has that not mm-hmm. a lot of people understand is you have the ability to dictate your own space. If you have a website and they and someone can type you in what's the best restaurant in whatever and yours pops up, you already have familiarity bias checked off. You have social proof checked off. The more of these mental shortcuts you can check off, the easier the decision will be for these people because when we talk about like how psychological processing, the subconscious can process millions of, of bits of data per second. The conscious can only only process about 40 bits of data, like just a, le- like a little tiny bit. So mm-hmm. your subconscious is doing 95% of the processing for every decision you make from the shirt you put on to the coffee you drink to where you walk the next day, right? To the interactions you make with people. All of it's being done by the subconscious, pretty much every single piece of it. So that I like Google because when someone has a problem, they're searching on Google to solve it specifically. TikToks are not really solving. Yes. Yeah, it's yeah. solving an entertainment issue, a problem. But it's more of like you just have to be lucky enough to get on our for you page, <laughs> which means you gotta post a lot, which means you gotta be funny a lot, which means you have to be entertaining a lot. Like there's some work that goes into that platform, but Google in itself is a solving platform. That's all it is solving a problem and that that goes way back to like seo basics and keyword you know keyword like basics for that stuff too so i just i like google's stuff because from a psychological standpoint they just do it really well 
Yeah, I agree. I think I think Google is a staple. I think it will always yeah. be a staple. There's a lot of people saying that TikTok will will, uh, <laughs> will overcome it for a search engine basis, <laughs> which kind of baffles me uh, because I don't know whether it's a generation thing. It probably it probably is. We're probably too old to be talking to what the kids <laughs> are doing now. But this morning, I wanted to know, to give you an example, I wanted to know how to remove stains from my Tupperware. So I, I thought, oh, I'll, I'll do what the cool kids yeah. do and I'll TikTok it. And I did it and it was the same, it was the same result, yep. the All same over video over. over and over again, which mm-hmm. didn't work anyway. Whereas with, yeah. whereas with Google, I can go through like four different yeah. things very quickly yep. as well. Whereas with a video, I have to spend time and watch it. So that, that's another <laughs> conversation for another time, but it's been, it's, it's been a real Thank pleasure you. having you on. I think for me anyway, massive <laughs> learning experience. Like I find this stuff it's incredible, so like how our brain works. Oh like, my gosh. Yeah. It's yeah. Like sales psychology and stuff mm-hmm. blows my mind. I love reading about that stuff. So it's been a real pleasure. Uh, hopefully you've listened at home. You've also learned something about how your customers work and how you can, and how you can sell more without selling harder. Uh, but if people want to check you out on what you do, what's the best place? Always on Twitter. Find you? You could, I mean, I'm on Twitter all day long, every day, uh, just at Sarah Levenger, L E V I N G R. Uh, and that, I, that's basically the best spot to find me. I do have a website, which is funny. I, I am on Google, but I don't prioritize it because my particular uh, customer is on Twitter. Go where your customers are. That's what, I, that's what I'm trying to get people to understand. Go where your customers are. Lovely. Thank you so much, Sarah. Real pleasure. Um, and thanks for being on the DC Deep Dive. And that's it for the DC Deep Dive this week. Thanks very much, Sarah. Fantastic episode. And it's safe to say that I'm now worried about what my brain is thinking behind my back. Remember, you can rate us on whatever platform of choice, whether that's Spotify or iTunes. Give us a rating, preferably five. That would help us get up those rankings. Make sure you subscribe on all the platforms. Follow me on Twitter at Sour Fraser and the D2C Deep Dive. Just search us. We'll be on there and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.